Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. My name is Jessica. I'm uh, from the Chelmsford Library, and I'm here with Jane O'Neill. We're going to get started in just another couple minutes. Um, and I will just start by announcing a couple of upcoming programs. I do want to make sure that everyone knows that the pop-up library is on the move again. Um, we are making various stops around town. Uh, check our website for an updated calendar that should be posted by Thursday um, for July. Uh, but we will make stops at Friendship Park, um, the, and Summer Place, the Senior Center, McKay Branch Library, and a few other special stops in between, and the market um, on the common on Saturdays. Um, also, we are going to start back up our um, summer concerts at McKay. Uh, so the first one is going to be on July 6th, and that's Abe Ovedia with uh, some classical jazz. And then on, let's see, on July 13th, we are going to start up our Con we're going to have the Ben Knight Band, which is some great R&B. Um, we have Retropolitan, which is some great 1950s rock and roll, good old fashioned rock and roll. And then on um, June 27th, Mika's Groove Train is going to come back. And Mika's Groove Train is um, lots of neo soul and R&B. Um, some the singer has an amazing voice. So definitely check those out. Those are Wednesday evenings beginning at 6.30 p.m. starting on July 6th. And then also I do want to make sure that everyone knows that Jane O'Neill will be back. We're taking July off for this series, um, but we're going to be back on the last Tuesdays in August, which is um, August 30th. And the last third last Tuesday in September, which is September 27th. Um, so we're very excited that she has agreed to come back for those. But anyway, tonight I'm really excited about this program. Um, if you have not uh, been able to join us for any of these programs so far, um, I know we partnered with Tewksbury on these programs, so we may have some new member, some new uh, viewers. Um, Jane O'Neill holds a master's in art history from Boston University and a master's in education from the Harvard University Graduate School of Education. She's a New Hampshire native and has worked at some of the state's most esteemed cultural institutions, including the League of New Hampshire Craftsmen, where she served as executive director and the Courier Museum of Art, where she held the role of senior educator. Jane founded the Courier Alzheimer's Cafe and led the tour program for the museum and the Frank Lloyd Wright designed Zimmerman House. She has taught art history at the college level for more than a decade, most recently at the New Hampshire Institute of Art. Her organization is Culturally Curious. Culturally Curious is a nonprofit that has the mission to engage, educate, and unify groups through facilitated art arts experiences that inspire joy and foster critical and creative thinking, as well as an appreciation for our shared humanity. Tonight, um, as and and I, I, you know, it aligns really well with Pride Month. Um, she's going to talk to us about Keith Haring, AIDS advocacy and art. During his short life, Keith Haring had a meteoric meteoric rise from graffiti artist to the world of fine art to mainstream success. His iconic figures still function as familiar and beloved symbols in American culture. Um, tonight, we'll learn more about the artist, the launch of his career, and his advocacy around AIDS awareness. Um, please send your questions to the chat um, or the Q&A module to be asked after the program. And um, thank you so much, Jane, for joining us again tonight. It's my pleasure. Absolutely. Thank you, Jess. And thank you, everybody, for taking time out of your day to learn a little bit more about Keith Haring. I'm always very mindful when I'm competing with good weather. And so I'm particularly humbled and honored that you're sharing the next hour with me and Keith Haring. So if you're not familiar with this artist's names, with this artist's name, surely you're familiar with the kind of imagery that I have on the screen. 
screen right now. This is an untitled work from 1983. But once you see these little dancing figures um, that seem to kind of radiate energy and, um, and evoke uh, movement, you know immediately the artist that we're talking about. And so often his imagery is tied in with bigger themes of love and connection. So I wanted to start off with this great image here with this, you know, the world encircled by this radiating heart and these giant hands holding it um, together. So this is in so many ways, Keith Haring in a nutshell shell. But today we're going to be talking about this incredible success that he was. He was a pop culture icon. He was a critical success. And in so many ways, these little dancing figures embodied the decade of the 1980s. Now, Keith Haring once said, art is for everyone. And he endeavored to make his work as accessible as possible during, uh, during the decade of the 1980s. So tonight we'll learn a little bit about his life, his career, his commercial success, and his efforts to educate around AIDS and other issues. So let's dive in. Let me give you a sense in terms of how we'll use this next hour together. We've got a photograph of Keith Haring over here on the right. We'll start off with a quick introduction to the artist, turn our attention to some of his initial works when he goes to New York City, his quick rise to fame and acclaim, how his artwork intersects with the commercial world um, and how he sort of piggybacks on the career of, of Andy Warhol to reach that commercial success. And then we'll um, turn our attention to his some of his murals. He was a prolific mural painter and kind of wrap up with AIDS advocacy and his legacy. So a lot to cover here. All right, so let's get started with an introduction to the artist. Keith Haring was born in 1958 in Cutstown, Pennsylvania. And um, well, he was raised in Cutstown, Pennsylvania. And you, we can see that he came from like a, a you know, a, an ideal, a nuclear American family here, uh, a really sort of middle-class upbringing. He was the oldest of four and he had three little sisters and he had a deep connection with his father who was an amateur cartoonist. So from a very young age, as early as one, Keith Haring would sit on his father's lap and they kind of draw pictures together. At, at a certain point, his father would simply draw shapes and Keith Haring would expand upon those shapes. He spent a lot of his childhood um, thinking about art, sort of sequestering himself away, always drawing. I love these really endearing images of him as a child. And then I think it's, um, it's, it's, so it's a great reminder to see him sitting on his bed as, as a child. Um, and just knowing that he kind of, you know, took himself out of social situations because he had this need to draw. That's not to say he was unaware of what was happening in the world. I mean, he grew up, really came of age in the 1960s. He was too young to take part in any of the cultural or political revolutions, but he was aware of them. And I think it instilled in him a, a consciousness of, of, um, of, of revolution, really, that we'll see in, in his later works, too. Now, this photograph of him sitting on his bed is also great because you can see Snoopy in the background. And of course, an artist with this kind of cartoonish signature style certainly was influenced by artists like Charles Schultz and Walt Disney and Dr. Seuss. He actually cites these two um, as being uh, particular influences on him. So, you know, the, the hard black outline in a lot of the, the drawings from this era certainly come to influence Keith Haring and his work as well. I also wanted to share this with you because it's just so unbelievably sweet. This is a, a page that he wrote called, when I grow up, I would like to be an artist in France. The reason is because I like to draw. I would get uh, my money from the pictures I would sell. I hope I will be one. And of course we know that that actually works out for him and we'll see just how it plays out. So Keith Haring graduates from high school in 1976. We can see he's got the long hair by this point and he's sort of uh, thirsting for a different kind of experience. So he moves out of the small town that he'd grown up in and he goes to the big city of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania um, to study commercial art. And he realizes pretty quickly that this is not going to work for him because everybody he was there studying with talked about like 
like, I'm just doing the commercial art to pay the bills. I have my other, you know, passion projects that really feed my soul. And for Keith Haring, he thought, why not just focus on the passion projects? That's what he wanted to do. He didn't want to sort of divide up his time that way and work on anything that wasn't really um, important to him. Now, a couple of important things do happen to him while he's in Pittsburgh. First, he has his first one-man show at a very young age, clearly, and he's also exposed to um, a little bit of art history and some artists that become very influential to him and his work. Uh, the first is Jackson Pollock. We can see uh, 1950s Jackson Pollock over here on the left, this one's called Convergence. And what you'll see in terms of an influence from Jackson Pollock is this kind of all over abstract patterning in Jackson Pollock's work that the emphasis on line, certainly, you know, you can just kind of follow one particular color around in Jackson Pollock's paintings. Um, this is something that deeply influences uh, Keith Haring and we'll see how it kind of translates into his work in his kind of cartoonish style. Uh, the other aspect of Jackson Pollock's work that I think comes into play is that Jackson Pollock would almost go into a trance when he was creating these splash paintings on the floor. He was letting his unconscious uh, guide so much of that process. And I think we'll see a little bit of that with Keith Haring as well. Another major artist that Keith uh, Herring was uh, influenced by and exposed to at this young age was the artist Christo, or, or we know them today as Christo and Jean-Claude, and a work like The Running Fence, this 24 and a half mile, 18 foot high fabric fence that ran along the California coast, something like this was um, galvanizing to a young artist like Keith Haring because it was temporary, it was sort of ephemeral that way, and it involved engaging all these different people in the, in the entire process. So Keith Haring was really sort of floored by the idea that you could take art outside of the museum world, outside of the gallery world, and create something really novel um, using it, people and interacting with people, making art accessible, which, is, which becomes his core driver throughout his artistic career. So after he leaves his commercial art program, he moves to New York City, the big city, and it's um, right around 1980 at this point. So he enrolls in the School of Visual Arts, and he's studying painting, sculpture, art history, performance art, and importantly, semiotics. So he's studying the whole history um, and interpretation of signs and signifiers. And I think that really comes into play. We'll, we'll look at how that comes into play when he starts creating works in his um, signature style. So he looks a little bored as he's riding the train in this early picture, but we can see that um, that he is surrounded by this kind of visual world that is going to inform his work and sort of feed uh, uh, his inspiration over the years ahead. He's also living in New York City in the East Village at a time when there's all these young creatives coming together, kind of working outside of the norm, the accepted world as like, you know, you have the rise of, of the yuppies in, in New York City and, um, and, and, and just a, a sort of of this new fast moving economy. There are these young creatives in, um, in the East Village who are um, making things outside of that, responding to it in so many ways. So let's turn our attention to the work that Keith Haring was creating in those early years in New York City. So he's a young art student. And what is he most interested in? He's most interested in the graffiti that he saw in the subway stations. Now, please note, these images are not works by Keith Haring, but this is the sort of thing that he was seeing when he was going down into the subway and taking the train. Train cars that were absolutely covered in graffiti. And for Keith Haring, he wrote about how it was the most beautiful thing he had ever seen. And of course, these subway artists were spending, you know, all night working on these designs. And most of them had, you know, the same thing in common, you know, this hard black outline to a lot of the designs all over patterning. Artists 
working really quickly without necessarily having a game plan in mind. So there was a lot to it that um, that Keith Haring just uh, very quickly responded to. It resonated with him. And when he was a, a young student still uh, uh, studying at the School of Visual Arts, he meets and befriends a, a, an up and coming graffiti artist named Jean-Michel Basquiat, who of course becomes one of the most celebrated artists of the era. So here they are together as young men. Um, I just love how, how sweet and innocent they look in this photograph over here on, on the left. And on the right, you can get a sense of, of, of uh, Basquiat's early graffiti work. It was mostly text-based. But, um, but even at this early stage in the 1980s, Keith Haring had, um, had the real sense that the world of graffiti art really belonged to Black men and Latino men. And he thought, you know, I don't want to usurp what they're doing. I don't want to be like the white guy that comes in and says, I can do this too, or I can do this better. So he wanted to find um, a different way to express himself that was similar. It had that same sort of immediacy that it would get out to everybody. Um, but he needed to find a different way to do that. So he did a few experiments. Um, some of it was spray painting, um, but a lot of it was text based. And what he he would do was uh, kind of rearrange words from the the headlines of the New York Post and create his his own headlines, Xerox a bunch of copies of them, and then plaster them all over lampposts in New York City. These these rearranged headlines that he was creating oftentimes dealt with issues of power and violence and subjugation. He really liked the idea that he could just put them up and people would be confronted with them, and it would sort of become a, a part of their consciousness without them even realizing or agreeing to that. But ultimately, he finds his medium one day down in the subway. What he encounters is the fact that the New York City subway system was renting out all of this um, designated space for ads. And when ads expired, they would simply put a piece of black paper, black matte paper over the expired ad until somebody else came along and paid for new ad space. And so to Keith Haring, all of a sudden one day he looked at that black matte paper and he thought, that's my canvas. And he went up to the surface level, up into the city, bought some chalk and immediately came back down and started creating works of art on these on these black matte paper sheets that were all over the subway system. I love this image here because somebody's on a payphone. First of all, they don't even exist in New York City anymore. Um, just casually having a conversation as a graffiti artist is making work next to her. And I think what's really important to know is that he was making these drawings without any preparation without any plan. And he was doing them very quickly. You can go on YouTube and, and watch videos of him just um, just really, uh, uh, you know, busting one of these out in, in the space of a minute or two. Uh, they always had a white frame around them. So they were sort of contained almost like a, a cartoon panel in some ways. And they all have these recognizable uh, silhouettes uh, and, um, uh, they're sort of like chalk outlines in some ways. So he was going from subway station to subway station and, um, and he would do anywhere from like 30 to 40 new drawings a day. And he's always working quickly because he always, he was in the habit of working quickly in general, but he was trying to evade police because this was still considered graffiti art, even though it was chalk <laughs> and um, and it was on a temporary sheet of paper. But he loved the idea that what he was creating in the subways was going to be seen by millions. So he develops his own visual language here and he changes things around um, sort of like the words in a sentence so that they can have new meaning. Sometimes the barking dog is benign. Sometimes it's ruling over people. Oftentimes you see, so you see things like pyramids or TVs or computers for heads. And we'll see this radiating baby quite a bit because he adopts that as his own personal brand, like his personal logo. All right, so here are a few more images of Keith Haring making these subway drawings. And these are great images because you can see people are kind of stopping and pausing uh, to see what he's doing. And we get a sense of how he's using these same familiar symbols. They're almost like modern day hieroglyphs in some ways. Uh, and um, 
sort of reassembling them to make new meaning. I mean, what he's doing here is in, in many ways immediately accessible to so many people. And for Keith Haring, the fact that anybody might stop and watch him was such a win. This, I mean, these weren't necessarily people that would go to a gallery opening or a museum uh, exhibition, but he could, he could make them pause uh, during their busy commute, bring them out of the drudgery of commuting to see art being made firsthand. Now, um, it was almost as though, well, it, it was actually, that he recognized that what he was doing was in part drawing and in part a performance because people really liked to see what he was doing. People looked forward to discovering new drawings um, each and every day. So you can think of these drawings as almost like, um, well, I think Keith Haring to a certain extent thought of this uh, black matte paper is functioning like uh, a TV screen that's been turned off or a computer screen. And, um, and so he would add these images to them, always the chalk outline of a figure. There's no detail in terms of hair, face, clothing. These are archetypal figures. We can read them as representing all of humanity, representing ourselves when we see them. And so um, he always adds these little lines to indicate they're moving. So um, we, we see that these two figures sort of look like they're running together and they're both touching this heart. It's a very simple, very, um, very loving message. And, and it's rendered so quickly with this real confidence in terms of how he completes these lines. Now, as, as symmetrical as an image like this might be, the more time you spend with it, the more you realize that, oh, okay, these figures aren't identical to each other. Their bodies are a little bit different. Um, the way he's laid out their legs are different here too. So he has a really good sense in terms of how to use space and negative space. But in the end, it's like he is eyeballing all of this. And like I said, he's doing this without any preparation. Here's another Keith Haring design where we can see that familiar radiating baby this time inside a heart that is... Um, the head of, of this particular body over here. So here's just a few more peeks at his subway art. And like I said, you can go on YouTube and see a lot of videos of him making this art. And it's just amazing to see how quickly he did it. You oftentimes see spaceships, pyramids, um, cooling towers from nuclear power plants. He grew up you know, um, in the era of Three Mile Island. So he had a fair amount of anxiety about nuclear holocaust that comes into his work. But you know, depending on how it's organized, a nuclear reactor can seem benign or terrifying in his work. Uh, oftentimes you see this kind of glowing rod, which can function as a sword, a lightsaber, um, anything, and any number of ways, depending on the context. So it's really all about these different symbols being um, shuffled up and, and reorganized in each new drawing. So ultimately you can see Keith Haring's subway drawings as a synthesis of performance art, automatic writing, sort of tapping into the unconscious a little bit like uh, uh, Jackson Pollock before, and this notion of democratic access. Virtually anyone living in New York City might be able to, to glimpse one of these. Uh, and, and he's working so quickly, you can sort of think of him as kind of dancing these designs out. Now, like I said, this was an illegal activity. So he was occasionally caught and arrested while doing this, uh, arrested for criminal mischief and facing public property. It was usually just paying a fine. And then he was right back out on the street. Notice here too, he's already got a shirt with his radiating baby here. What we're looking at um, in this image is actually a screen grab from a little piece about him from CBS News, where they were following him around in the subway and actually documented him getting uh, arrested too. Which brings us to one of the last images in this section, which I find so powerful. Keith Haring had a friend named uh, Seng Pon Chi who was a photographer. And this is a, a photograph by that artist. Uh, Keith Haring would call his friend and let him know all of the locations of the new uh, subway drawings every day so that his friend could go out and document them. And this image just has, um, has a whole story to it because we can see Keith Haring's new drawing just outside the subway uh, doors here. Uh, a familiar image with the, the figure um, who is in this case riding the back of a giant centipede <laughs> whose head is a computer monitor with a whole other uh, sort of storyline playing out here. 
Keith Haring has just slipped inside the subway, evading capture, at least this one time, um, looking calm and confident in this moment as the subway doors close, perfectly framing in this moment the drawing that he's just executed. And of course, all around him is the, the graffiti of that you would typically see at this time in the subway, which is so markedly different from what he's doing at this time. So, um, so we get a good sense in terms of the drama of creating artwork inside the subway at this moment. These days, you can go to museums and see these uh, these subway drawings uh, hanging up, uh, uh, sort of immortalized and preserved in that context. I so love these designs that uh, a few months ago I went and looked on eBay to see if people, you know, uh, had were selling them because they became so popular that people began to steal them and and try to sell them even back in the eighties. I would say um, don't buy any of the $200 subway, <laughs> Keith Haring subway drawings on eBay because I have a feeling they are not legitimate. <laughs> so let's turn our attention now to how Keith Haring has this incredible rise to fame. Fame and acclaim. How do you go from underground drawings to high art? For Keith Haring, it was a meteoric rise. So what we are looking at in these two images, um, fuzzy images, I'm sorry. Uh, first over here is a gallery opening featuring his show, uh, featuring his work. And you can see that the walls are jam full with his images and the, the floor space is elbow to elbow. Over here on the right, we see the artist up on like a cherry picker here executing a mural in um in a museum space so while Keith Haring is in the midst of doing subway drawings, the art establishment begins to take notice. So in the early 1980s, he has his first show, his first group exhibition. Um, he's beginning to get invitations to paint all around the world. He becomes an international success um, for so many ways because of the subway drawings. He becomes a, a familiar entity, a commodity even. Incidentally, this mural back here with the figures and the heart, uh, we can see it better in this image. This is something that he could create in the space of two hours and sell for about $15,000 in the early 1980s. So he was doing very well financially as a very young man in, in the 1980s in New York City. So um, even though he's kind of penetrated this elitist, little snobby, skeptical world of fine art, Keith Haring really remained true to this underground culture that he was so attracted to in the East Village when he first moved to New York City. So he could move seamlessly from the world of high art to underground dance clubs. And, um, and I should say, Keith Haring loved to dance. This is him right at the center of this picture, having like a cathartic experience on the dance floor. You've probably already noticed in the background, he has uh, decorated this particular club that he's dancing in the Paradise Garage, which at the time was a multicultural, gay, straight, um, very open and accepting club down in the East Village. And this was a place where Keith Haring danced the night away <laughs> all the time. And he felt like he could be his most authentic self. He absolutely loved the pulsating experience on the dance floor in this club. And he wrote about it being like a quasi religious experience for him. So it's probably not surprising that some of his most recognizable figures are figures that are dancing. This is like Keith Haring at the Paradise Garage, essentially. It's people in all sorts of different um, poses. And at first you might even think, you know, those poses don't necessarily look very natural, but neither does what he's doing on the dance floor over here. I think he's really um, sort of channeling his own experiences dancing. And I think it is important in an image like this, even though it's so simplified and so cartoon-like that these figures are, of, are all of different colors because Keith Haring like to suggest, um, even subtly or blatantly in some cases, that people of all different backgrounds can come together and, and you know, have a quasi-religious experience dancing together or, um, 
for other uh, other profoundly peaceful experiences together as well. So um, so Keith Haring was a part of the club scene from the beginning and even sort of right up till the end. This is a photograph of him performing at an open mic uh, poetry night at Club 57. Notice how he puts the TV screen around his face. That's a, that's a motif that he uses in his artwork all the time. And then this is um, a much later and sort of more sophisticated uh, massive mural that he created for the Palladium nightclub. Now, Club 57 was really wh where he first gravitated towards when he first moved to New York City. And his close friend and fellow artist described the nightclub, Club 57, in this way. He said, at Club 57, there were drugs and promiscuity. It was one big orgy family. Sometimes I'd look around and say, oh my God, I've had sex with everybody in this room. It was just the spirit of the times. And it was before AIDS. Everybody there was either living together or sleeping together. So just to give you a sense of what that might have looked like, we have Keith Haring hanging out, I'm presumably at Club 57. This is a Basquiat over here, Haring over here. And right in the middle, we have Madonna, young Madonna, who is leaning in to see some of Keith Haring's drawings over here. So in addition to Madonna, you have this hive of creative minds that are coming together. You have Cindy Lauper and the B-52s, RuPaul, Fab Five Freddy, all coming together in this one spot and rubbing elbows and presumably sharing ideas. For Keith Haring, his relationship with Madonna is one that, um, that wasn't just uh, fleeting. They developed a, a real profound friendship. Uh, Madonna characterized them as um, different sides of the same coin. We can see her over here wearing a leather jacket that he has um, decorated with his paintings. Incidentally, if you go back and look at the video for Borderline, she's wearing clothes that are covered with Keith Haring's patterns on them. And she herself picks up a spray can and starts doing some graffiti art in the video. So there's like some interesting cross-pollination there. Um, over on the, on the right here, we have two tabloid magazines that Keith Haring has altered um, include, to include his radiating baby and dancing figures and that sort of thing. Now, these are, are tabloids that are, are focused on Madonna. And I just love them. Madonna on nude pics. So what? He altered these tabloids to give to her as a wedding present in 1985 when she married Sean Penn. So uh, in addition to being good friends with Madonna, Keith Haring also establishes early on a relationship, um, a sort of a mentorship friendship with who else? Andy Warhol. So here he is with Jean-Michel Basquiat at Andy Warhol's uh, studio, The Factory. Here, here he is with Andy Warhol taking those tabloids to uh, those altered tabloids to get ready to go to Madonna's wedding. Um, being in Andy Warhol's circle uh, was profoundly <laughs> important to Keith Haring's career. And certainly um, the trailblazing that Andy Warhol had done in his career in terms of pop art, making artwork commercial and appealing was something that, um, well, those are the coattails essentially that Keith Haring got to ride on. So Keith Haring honored Andy Warhol in his art by creating the character of Andy Mouse, loosely inspired, well, directly inspired by Mickey Mouse and and the drawings that Andy, that Keith Haring grew up with. And so he turns his mentor into a new American icon by adding the ears and oftentimes dollar signs <laughs> to suggest that, um, that Andy has this important role in American culture. And, um, and don't be jaded about the dollar signs because for Keith Haring, the, the close association between uh, Andy Mouse and, and money was the suggestion that Andy Warhol was the American dream because he had become so financially successful as an artist. Andy Warhol returned the favor by creating this really kind of dreamy uh, silkscreen portrait of, of Keith Haring. This one one, I believe, is on a t-shirt. You can sort of vaguely see the outline here. And Keith Haring also signed it with an Andy Mouse here. I this I imagine this would be quite the collector's item today. Um, because of this relationship with uh, Andy Warhol, other relationships kind of came into place really easily. Keith Haring was introduced to the musician and model Grace Jones at... Um, 
at a magazine shoot for Andy Warhol's magazine interview. He painted her body. They became fast friends and went clubbing together for years after that. He also worked with the most influential hip hop group of the 1980s, um, Run DMC. And we can see him here. I think this is probably for an ad for, uh, for Adidas. And um, we can see the background. Keith Haring has done the artwork here. He's also did cover artwork, uh, album cover artwork for Run and DNC too. Keith Haring also became friends with Yoko Ono. I mean, talk about icons meeting icons, right? Mm -hmm. So here we see uh, Keith Haring with Yoko Ono and one of her sons. And here's Yoko Ono hanging out with Keith Haring and his parents. You can only imagine what they thought of their son's meteoric rise in the middle of the 1980s. Um, Keith Haring also uh, collaborated with Yoko Ono too. So we're looking at two promotional pieces here for a week long event focused on dance. Uh, uh, you can see Yoko Ono does the music and Keith Haring does the sets. But so there's a, a great collaboration there. And you know, Keith Haring loved to dance. Look at these figures here. It was, um, it was meant to be. But this is a little series of photos that always blows my mind when I see it because this is a series of photos from Yoko Ono's home um, at, at the Dakota in um, the Dakota apartment building in New York City where we can see Keith Haring is there on the occasion of Sean Lennon's ninth birthday. This is 1984. And he's accompanied by none other than Steve Jobs, Andy Warhol, and some others. And they're looking at Sean Lennon's new Macintosh computer. I mean, imagine if Steve Jobs was there to install your computer when you got your first computer. But I think what's really interesting about this series of photos and imagining, you know, the brain trust that's in this room is that on the screen of that computer is one of Keith Haring's designs. So his work and his um, creative ability was at the center of this of the dialogue in this particular room, which is amazing. So we'll wrap up this section on fame and acclaim with this quick view into Keith Haring's apartment, which you can see was uh, most certainly decorated by his friends, other graffiti artists here. Uh, we can see little uh, suggestions of, of some of his uh, inspiration around the, the room, but, but it's covered in graffiti art. And one of the things that Keith Haring started to do is whenever his friends would come over, he would kind of use the blank space of his <clears throat> refrigerator door as like a register to have his friends kind of sign in. So over the years, dozens of artists and musicians used that door as like a, as, as a canvas, as a blank canvas for their graffiti or for their signature. And so um, after he moved out of this apartment, the, the refrigerator stayed, the, the landlord repainted the, the apartment and rented it out to somebody else who immediately recognized the value of the door. And when the refrigerator died, she, she took the door off of the refrigerator, saved it from it going to the dump and essentially stored it in her parents' attic for a couple of decades. And just last year, I believe it was auctioned off for about $25,000. The, the, the refrigerator door includes some graffiti. I can't find it myself, but it does say somewhere Madonna loves Keith. As most certainly it has Andy Warhol's signature on there. Uh, there's a JM, which most people think is Jean-Michel Basquiat. Uh, so, so there's a lot of really famous people that have been included there. And, um, you know, we should, we should all hope to discover something so valuable in our lives too. So we have this notion that he's famous and what happens happens next is he becomes a commercial success. Now, this can be a tricky thing in the art world because you don't want to be a sellout, right? But the thing that happens with Keith Haring is that his images are so recognizable and seemingly so easy to copy that there are knockoffs almost immediately all around the world. People would send him merchandise that they were finding being sold in the streets of Brazil or Tokyo or wherever. They would send it to him and just say, like, look at 
this. People are dying for your work. And so here he is, I believe he's in Japan in this image, and he's pointing at work that is obviously a knockoff. So he realizes that there's a demand for what he's creating. And he is the, the artist that wants to make his artwork accessible. He doesn't just want to sell, you know, million dollar paintings off the walls of galleries. So what he does with Andy Warhol's encouragement is he creates a shop in Soho in New York City called The Pop Shop. Note the radiating baby right there at the center. Uh, he opens The Pop Shop in 1986 and he said, The Pop Shop makes my work accessible. It's about participation on a big level. Critics hated the idea. They, they compared it to like selling his work like fast food, dumbing it down in some ways. But let's take a look at what was going on inside the pop shop. Keith Herring decorated the interior of the space. They were selling things, you know, the same sort of things that you would see in a museum gift shop these days. And it was all, um, you know, licensed by him, created by him. It was, what, there weren't any knockoffs there, but everything was reasonably priced. You could get a little radiating baby uh, pin for yourself for about three bucks. Incidentally, the reason why Keith Haring uh, adopted the radiating baby as his personal signature or logo, he said, um, there's, there's nothing negative about a baby ever. He said it's the purest form of the human experience. And so that's why he, he made it his own. So, um, so here's another image of him standing inside the pop shop. You can see some of the, the t-shirts that were being sold at the time, including a t-shirt that has Andy Warhol's face on it. So I can't emphasize enough the outsized influence that an artist like Andy Warhol had in the decision to create a space like this. Because Andy Warhol, Warhol was the artist who um, fantasized about mechanizing art, about, um, I mean, he called his own uh, studio the factory. And so Keith Haring created a series of prints right around this time that he called the pop shop, where you can see one of his familiar figures sort of struggling with this computer or machine, um, something that seems to be churning out more of his little figures. Perhaps this figure is going in to fix it. But I think that this is signifying that um, he's kind of cranking these, these images out like a machine himself. And, and this figure is getting pulled out by another um, figure uh, over on the right. So the pop shop ran for about 20 years. The, the store closed in 2005 and the Herring Foundation donated all of that artwork um, to the New York Historical Society. So when you go to visit that museum, you can see the Keith Herring work right above the admissions desk there. And you can still buy all of the um, the Keith Herring licensed merch online from the, the Herring Foundation. And note, the prices are still pretty good. I mean, I've seen a lot of um, inflated prices in museum gift shops. So this is still pretty attainable, I would say, to the average person if you're dying to have your own radiating baby. Now, during his lifetime, Keith Herring um, uh, licensed his, his, his work, created uh, special designs for a number of different products. And is there a more iconic 80s product than a swatch watch. <laughs> he did this whole series for them that includes some of his dancing figures and other really familiar motifs. Now, swatch watches were, um, the concept there is that they were supposed to be relatively low cost, but high design. So swatch watches went for about $50 in the 80s. But this series, um, and you can see just the edge of a K here, this series with one of the bands signed by Keith Haring, it was uh, recently listed online for, uh, for $10,000. So these are real collector's items now. Keith Haring also contributed to the Absolute Vodka marketing campaign. Andy Warhol had already done his own ad for Absolute Vodka, encouraged Keith Haring to follow up. And, um, and so this was the result. And what I love about his work is that it feels like a dance party, right? It's like a night at the Paradise Garage, all of these dancers down here. And, um, and the silhouette of the bottle kind of containing it or, you know, inspiring the party at this point. But because Keith Haring did everything so quickly and did it freehand, notice that the bottle is not symmetrical. That iconic bottle that is at the heart of everything in terms of this ad campaign is just kind of suggested because Keith Haring, you know, kind of, um, 
churns these out so quickly, uh, but still with, I, I think, with a, a high degree of professionalism here. He, he uh, contributed his patterns and designs to various car companies, including this is Range Rover, we've got BMW, and this is a child-sized Ferrari over here on the left. Notice how this is all over patterning. This always reminds me of Pollock when I see it. And basically, he, he would just uh, bring a boom box, turn on, um, turn on music and just go into this kind of unconscious mode, completely covering um, the surface of these vehicles. Now, since his death, his death, his artwork has been licensed for a variety of things, anywhere from um, espresso cups and saucers to dog bowls. I was kind of surprised to see his work at an Abercrombie and Fitch on t-shirts. It's also been licensed to um, Mac Cosmetics uh, multiple times over the years. If you really love your Keith Haring, you can get your own Keith Haring design rug at Ruggable. Uh, various uh, museum shops use Keith Haring sort of inspired products like the chess set over here for the moment. Um, design store, and then things come full circle because the Funko Pop figurines here actually feature Keith Haring himself. So he's become a commodity as well. Now, if all of this leaves sort of a yucky taste in your mouth, if you just think, okay, well, this is really just about selling stuff at this point, I think I will redeem Keith Haring in your eyes with this next section here on public works. So Keith Haring created about 50 murals um, during the course of his life. And um, they were all over the world, Paris, Pisa, Barcelona, um, Berlin, and, um, and oftentimes he focused his work at children's hospitals and children's center children's centers. About 31 of these murals remain today. Perhaps the best known mural is the Crack is Whack mural. <laughs> and this was painted in Harlem in an abandoned handball court. Uh, this is a bridge here that connects Harlem to the Bronx. And uh, Keith Haring saw that space and he thought, it, you know, it's practically a billboard. It's just waiting for something. And he was um, personally touched by the crack epidemic in that one of his studio assistants uh, developed an addiction to crack. And so he saw what happened firsthand, particularly for someone who didn't have the money to, to really get the intensive medical treatment that somebody would need to, to um, get off of crack. So one day he just rented a van, put some ladders in, brought some paint and just started painting the crack is whack mural. I love this image here because we can see, you know, a few kids on bikes just ride up and sit down. And so he got to make it a performance, which I think was always kind of fulfilling for him. And if we look at the imagery here, um, really simple imagery, easy to decode. You know, you have a crack pipe, uh, you're burning your money, you have the suggestion of death. And then in this case, this figure being fed to a monster. Whenever you have an X on somebody's chest in this case, um, it will, in, in Keith Haring's work, it's usually the suggestion of death. So um, so he he said, you know, you don't need to get a, mur uh, a permit or anything. You just show up with a ladder and people think you're official. Well, he made the, uh, the error of then sitting down after he was done and smoking a joint. And so that's when the police came up to him and started asking him about the mural. He was arrested for it and, um, and was going to be charged with the crime. But almost immediately, the mural that he created became a, a powerful symbol to for people to talk about the crack epidemic. It was featured on, on news segments. I believe it was even featured in like a New York City based campaign against crack. And so the, even the mayor at the time was in this difficult bind because he was anti-graffiti and anti-crack. He's like, how do I handle this? So Keith Haring's uh, potential prison sentence of a year was reduced down to, I think, $100. And shortly after he painted the Crack is Whack mural, um, it was defaced. And so the city actually invited him back <laughs> to paint a new one. <laughs> so here he is with the new Crack is Whack mural. Here is um, a photo of him with the head of the Parks Department who was assisting him in creating this mural. You can imagine, you know, after arresting you for creating the first one now, the city really wants to make sure you're happy while you create the second one. I really like the second one a lot better. This is the one that is still there today. Um, you've got this giant figure of the skull with the burning money, with the crack pipe. But then all of his first 
familiar figures in the background who at first look like they're having the party of their lives, but we can see um, some of them are kind of slumped over. It reminds me of medieval depictions of hell with all these figures kind of writhing around um, in what artists imagined was, you know, as awful as, as what hell might look like. The back of this wall was also painted by Keith Haring. All of uh, both sides were recently restored. And the detail that I just love so much is that the park around it was sort of revitalized and renamed Crack is Whack Playground. So you can just imagine calling up your friends saying, let's go meet, meet at Crack is Whack. <laughs> but clearly he created an icon. Now he continued to create murals all around the world. This is a mural that he created in Melbourne, Australia in 1984. Um, and what's really kind of amazing about his process is that even with murals, he wasn't doing preparatory drawings. He literally just started painting and really just didn't stop. He never even kind of stood back and looked at the entire composition. He just kept working. Even Michelangelo stepped back from the Sistine Chapel, went down to the floor and tried to get a sense of, of scale and proportion. For Keith Haring, he just pushes through, he gets kind of in the zone and he can create something that um, that is like well-organized and well-balanced, immediately accessible and yet still kind of um, mysterious enough that, that it prompts more careful looking. So we've got all of these kind of dancing falling figures, um, two figures riding a centipede at the top, one of them with this glowing rod or sword. And the centipede has a uh, computer for her head and we can see on the screen the, the creature's brain. So there's a lot going on here. It's deceptively simple. Now, Keith Haring was invited all over the world. This is a mural that he did for a museum in Amsterdam. He was asked to um, spray paint this piece of vellum that sort of modulates the light in this big open area. And so he he did it publicly. He It became a performance piece. And this, this piece of vellum that he was painting was about 40 feet by 60, almost 70 feet. So it's a huge piece of vellum. And he did the work in one day. Um, here he is working in his socks, creating that painting. You can imagine everybody was, you know, just absolutely flabbergasted to see how he worked without preparation, without sketches, just filling up that entire space there. Um, he, uh, cre he was actually invited by the Checkpoint Charlie Museum to go to Berlin in, um, in 1986 to create a, a mural on the Berlin Wall. So, um, so he was going, you know, sort of six feet into the territory of East Berlin uh, to paint this massive uh, stretch of the Berlin Wall, which is 14, was 14 feet high. His section was about 300 feet long. And he was very well aware of, of you know, this symbolic significance of him painting this. And he was well aware too of, you know, the danger he faced in doing this. There were armed guards on the, on the Eastern side of the Berlin Wall who were standing there watching him. Um, but this, the wall, because it was, you know, a symbol and a functional symbol of, of divisiveness, it was really the antithesis of everything that Keith Haring stood for. I mean, he was, he was drawing symbols of love from the get-go. So he was risking arrest. He was risking, um, uh, uh, death really by doing this. And, um, he takes up the commission. He decides to, uh, have the, the yellow, the, the yellow background that, that was painted in advance of his arrival. And he decides to uh, create this chain of figures in black and red, recalling the traditional German flag, unifying these figures together. And, um, and he paints really quickly. And while he's doing it, he's surrounded by reporters. There's um, there's a helicopter, uh, an American helicopter buzzing around over his head. He said he'd never worked in such circus-like conditions, but he stayed really, um, really tuned in to the humanitarian reason why he was there. He called it a humanistic gesture, even if it was a provocative one. He knew that it was just going to be a temporary art installation, but to him, it was a political and subversive act to just, you know, mentally 
uh, destroyed the wall by painting it. So here he is um, with the finished product. Uh, it only took him five hours to paint this work, this 300 foot long stretch of the Berlin Wall. And the New York Times wrote, the entire world should know that it happened, reinforcing its political significance. Now, almost immediately, it was defaced. Uh, it was destroyed by other artists. Uh, one artist in particular who added a lot of gray there said, you know, the Berlin Wall is such a dark symbol it shouldn't have, you know, happy cartoons painted on it. Um, and over, you know, the course of the next few months, it, it became hard to even find the remnants of what Keith Haring had painted. So we all know, of course, that within the space of just a few years, three years later, the Berlin Wall came down. And just 100 days after that, Keith Haring would pass away. So, um, so these days, the, the wall isn't there. Keith Haring is no longer there. But he knew and he even wrote about in his journal how, um, how, how it's, you know, the camera can make these things permanent. So even if the, the work of art itself is a, is a temporary ephemeral installation, it can still have a tremendous power and impact. One of the last major works Keith Haring did um, was this uh, uh, mural that he created in Pisa, Italy. He was invited to paint on the side of a church there. And at this point in his life, he's doing a lot of really fun, kind of fascinating, surreal forms. He's still using his familiar um, archetypal characters, but he's transforming them into other beasts. You know, sometimes they have tails, sometimes they look like they are part human, part bird. Um, uh, I mean, he's, he's, he's modifying these figures in fascinating ways, but he also includes... Um, you know, things like a devil and an angel, a mother and a baby, things that um, have, have, you know, defined his work from the get-go, but it, it's clear he's fe feeling a little un uh, unchained, untethered here, but ever the, the, the promoter, ever, ever someone who really understands marketing, his, his uh, promotional materials that he designed for that campaign are, um, are classic Keith Haring. Now, I just wanted to show you very quickly just a few works that he did um, with or for children, because that was such a huge part of his personal mission during his lifetime. Um, this is a massive mural that he created. It's six stories high, um, created in 1986 in Celebration celebration of the 100th anniversary of the Statue of Liberty. So he did this entire painting without any preparation, without any uh, 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 plan or design. He did the outline of the Statue of Liberty, and then he invited 900 children from all over Manhattan, all five boroughs, to come in and fill in the work with different colors. So it was a real collaboration, and um, and in the end, this, this six-story high work of art, I believe it's one of his biggest, um, is still, it still represents, you know, all that is patriotic. In fact, you can see Paul McCartney saying in front of it at the Super Bowl in 2002, just on the heels of, of September 11th. So um, the whole country was feeling like they needed these symbols of unity and patriotism. And that's when, um, when this work by, by Keith Haring, um, you know, could really shine. His commitment to children extended to a lot of commissions for painting um, murals at children's hospitals. We know as a young boy, he wanted to paint in France. This was a children's hospital in France. You can see the Eiffel Tower in the background. Uh, he painted the, an exterior stairwell with these uh, familiar dancing figures, but also you know the bright primary colors as well. The hospital is no longer there, but they preserved the, the stairwell. So now it's like the Keith Haring Tower there. And, um, and some more work that he did just outside of a children's hospital in Long Island uh, was he had his, his designs commissioned into sculptures. And he said that he always imagined his sculptures as things to play on. I, I, I really love his, his figures bending over backwards like this. I think he could have had a wonderful second career as a playground designer. So we'll wrap up this section about public art with this sort of unusual commission um, towards uh, the, the end of his life. This is 1988. And you can see here that there's just something off about his, 
about his um, his pose here. He looks a little dejected every time I see him. Um, he, he doesn't look proud of his work. He doesn't look like he's particularly happy in this moment because he is actually at the White House. Um, he's done this um, this mural, which would be uh, for as part of the, the Easter celebration at the White House. Now, it's always an honor to get invited by the president to uh, participate in anything at the White House, but this was Ronald Reagan and this was in the middle of the AIDS epidemic. So Keith Haring was there. He created works for children. It was donated to a children's hospital. But I think he had really mixed feelings about um, doing anything that seemed like it was in support of the, the White House. Uh, in fact, one of the photographers that was there documenting the event actually said to him, like, what are you doing here? Here's this gay artist who's living in New York City where his friends are dying in droves, um, you know, representing his work and, and, and himself at the White House where, um, where this epidemic, where they were turning a blind eye essentially to this epidemic. At this point, um, already 45,000 people had died in the United States from AIDS and, um, and nobody was really talking about it or doing anything about it. So let's turn our attention now to, um, to the AIDS epidemic and Keith Haring's uh, role and response to it. So just very quickly, Keith Haring was an artist who donated his talents in support of a number of different um, causes, including, you know, things like the African Emergency Relief Fund, Crackdown was a benefit concert. He also supported anti-apartheid efforts. But um, his identity as a gay man and his um, connection to um, the AIDS epidemic was thrown into high relief by the end of the 1980s because, of course, Keith Haring um, was diagnosed with HIV in 1987 and um, full-blown AIDS the following year. So we see him here in this unbelievable photograph by the photographer Annie Leibovitz. This is from 1986, so before he is, um, before he's been diagnosed with anything, but we see here this emphasis on his line. And I wanted to share this picture here because he's, he's very vulnerable. This is a very sexual image in some ways. Um, but he, he said um, in his journals, he said, sexual energy may be the single strongest impulse I feel more than art. And he even talked about with his biographer, like, um, you know, creating these lines had like a sexual flow to it for him. So as as childlike as they might seem, as innocent as they might seem. I mean, he was a sexual person and that was really a part of, of the way he made art. He danced it and he felt it um, at a core level. Now his identity as a gay man maybe you can see it in sort of gently suggested in some of these early um, subway drawings, you know, are these two archetypal figures, could they be re read as, as the same gender? Perhaps, you know, um, maybe two figures becoming one here, maybe it's two men, perhaps. But by the end of the 1980s, um, he, because he is diagnosed with AIDS and because he decides to come out to the world and say, not only do I have AIDS, but I'm a gay man, um, this, this, facet of his identity um, informs the work that he's doing. So he's created um, posters for National Coming Out Day, another poster commemorating the Stonewall riots, and, um, and he takes on the issue of safe sex in his work. And so, um, so I think what's really important to emphasize at this point is that, of course, let's all go back to the 1980s and like how terrifying um, sex was because of AIDS and how dangerous gay sex was because of AIDS. He decided to make taboo busting works of art that made people confront their sexuality and the dangers of sex and the importance of safe, safe sex um, at a time when our culture was really not kind of ready to handle these kinds of images, but this was life and death, certainly, for, um, for Keith Haring and for so many others. So in addition to his artwork, 
he showed up for protests. We can see him here, um, uh, two photos from the same protest, but we can see that he's holding the sign that says 10,000 New York City AIDS death. How am I doing with the mayor on, on uh, pictured there? So he begins to create work, not necessarily with ACT UP. Um, oh, well, I, I guess I, I take that back in some cases with ACT UP, but he uh, adopts that, that pink triangle that is um, a symbol for ACT UP. And the motif that he develops for a lot of his AIDS messaging is the see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil, kind of three wise monkeys motif. Uh, he almost always put X's on the chests of those figures because they are they're people with a death sentence. And if you already have AIDS and you decide not to do anything about it, then um, then it equals death, certainly, if you're not telling your partner. Um, so they are his dancing fig figures, but they are um, they they have a death sentence, and and he makes his point so clear with with the text alongside it. Ignorance is fear, silence is death. He's trying to change people's behaviors. Here's another AIDS poster for you, um, where AIDS is represented as this red serpent. Two figures working together, coming together and, and forming a pair of scissors uh, cut that cut that serpent in half. Here's another way that he's taken that pink triangle and, um, and integrated his artwork in it. Uh, here he's kind of densely patterned the pink triangle with the see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil monkeys or figures, I should say. And, um, and then he's even lent those same designs to a guide for teens. Notice in this case, these figures don't have X on their chests. He's telling people who um, may not have uh, may not have any experience with AIDS, may not have any understanding of AIDS. Uh, even even if you're not sick with AIDS, if you turn a blind eye to it, it 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 um, it's it could have disastrous results for everybody. Here's another poster that he did for ACT UP. The familiar dancers, in this case, with with X's on their chests, and instead of really dancing, they've got this pose of of um, it, it, I always read it as like exasperation, but this is acting up. They're doing something for life um, to change, uh, if not their own outcomes, then the outcomes. Of, of other people who are at risk. So uh, Herring did other things to, um, uh, to help support efforts to, um, to, to end the epidemic of AIDS. There was the, the uh, Red Hot organization that was a nonprofit that used um, essentially pop culture to help combat um, the AIDS epidemic, to help inform people so they did a series of albums called Red Hot and Dance. Uh, Keith, Al or Keith Haring's work was the cover art for it. And then um, later in his life, Keith Haring founded the Keith Haring Foundation. This was in 1989, the year before he died. And the mission of the foundation is not just to educate people on AIDS and to support people that are living with AIDS, but he also tied into that um, uh, efforts to, to support children's organizations because that was always so important to him too. So the, the foundation also adopted the Radiating Baby as their logo and we can see one of their mobile units over here that's just covered in some of his designs. So a mobile medical unit that, um, that was serving people with AIDS. So the good news is, is that all that licensed Keith Haring merchandise that you might be tempted to buy online now, it all goes to support that effort. And then the story comes to a really abrupt halt because Keith Haring's life becomes to a really abrupt halt. And what we're looking at right now is an AIDS quilt to honor his work, his life, and his contributions. Um, this is not something that he created. This was created to um, by other people to recognize what he did. And it's sort of done in his style, but you can tell it's not quite his style. We've got the baby. We've got somebody in a hospital bed with an X on their chest, um, familiar skull with, with uh, wings. So um, it's just kind of devastating to to think about how um, how this young promising career was cut so short, and how um, and how you know all of this production that he was all of the work that he was creating, and how productive he was, how prolific it was. It comes to the screeching halt, and his life 
gets boiled down into these AIDS quilts. There's multiple quilts that were created in his honor. And whenever I look at the AIDS quilt, when it was laid out in the National Mall this way, I think of Keith Haring as the artist who was creating work that couldn't be contained by a museum or by an art gallery. And then I think of the fact that the AIDS quilt was so big so many people died from this epidemic that the AIDS quilt itself couldn't be contained by the size of the National Mall in Washington, DC. It's such a devastating epidemic and it's just so sad that Keith Haring died at such a young age. So let's talk a little bit about that death, his legacy. He died at age 31 in 1990 and his funeral was attended by more than a thousand people in New York City. And sometimes, amazingly, art critics um, hound on, on Keith Haring because, or they criticize him because his work never really changed. It never evolved. It never became something else, never developed into something seemingly more sophisticated. But he was only working for a decade. He was so young while he was working. Did it ever really have to evolve anyways? While he was alive, he created more than 10,000 works of art. And as I said, about 50 grand size murals, and he produced about 50 one man shows. It's, I mean, think about doing that just in the space of a decade. If he were alive today, he would be just 64 years old. But remar I mean, amazingly, he is going to be forever young because of, you know, the tragic loss of life here at such a young age. We know he wanted to be an artist who worked in France. And here he is sitting in a field just outside of Paris with a massive blimp with one of his pictures on it. And this was the artist that wanted to make his artwork as accessible to, as possible to everyone. I think when it's up on a blimp, you've pretty much accomplished your goal. His artwork is now a familiar part of American life. And this is a, a float from the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. This is back from 2008. And you have, you know, a, a, many artists today who are sort of working on the shoulders of Keith Haring. You have artists like Jeff Koons, um, the anonymous street artist Banksy, Murakami over here, artists who are interested interested in the commodification of art and celebrity, artists who are interested in making socially conscious street art, and artists that are not afraid to license their artwork for all sorts of commercial products. So, um, so basically what he established in the 1980s is still very much happening today with, uh, with you know, a, a vast number of artists. And I think we can even credit um, things like, you know, the familiar logos from tech companies today. This is all rooted in the aesthetic of Keith Haring. I mean, there, it's like this hard edge um, cartoon style that really uh, gets across a, an idea very quickly that there's a, a great immediacy to, to logos like this. Everything comes 360 with Keith Haring because about 10 years ago, there was a Google doodle acknowledging his birthday. Um, so he was on the homepage here and you can see his figures have been turned into the word Google. So we'll wrap up, as I always like to do, sort of thinking about where his art stands in the art market today. Um, uh, collectors really like uh, some of his more dense, more complicated imagery from later in the 1980s. Um, this image over here sold recently for close to $6 million. And I think just over $6 million is um, the, the highest price that's been paid at auction. Now, that is... Um, that's an impressive sum, but of course it pales in comparison to somebody like Andy Warhol, who recently sold, whose work recently sold for about $200 million. So, um, so I think if we look at this in, in the greater context of who Keith Haring was and what his goal was as an artist, I think he, would, he wouldn't even care that somebody had spent so much on his works of art because his goal was never to create works for, um, for you know, a small group of people who could afford a lot. Instead, he wanted to create work for everybody. And if in the end, you know, a million people or a hundred million people bought one of his little radiating baby pins, I think he would feel successful, way more successful in that than in selling a high priced work of art. Um, Keith Haring wanted to create work for everybody. And I think just 
based on the fact that we all recognize these images and we know we know and love them today. I think he was successful in that. So I'll end there for now and I'll start going through some of these questions in the chat along the way. See if we've got anything I can respond to here. Oh, Janine has added that, um, that that refrigerator door was featured at a Basquiat show last year at the MFA. Very, oh, that is very cool. I didn't know it was so close in Boston. Thanks for sharing that, Janine. Um, Julia has asked, is this slideshow available? Um, thank you for saying you love everything about it. And yes, uh, the Chelmsford Library is so uh, great and diligent about recording these and sharing them with people. Um, Jan, I, I love that you have enjoyed tonight's program. Thank you so much for your kind words. Uh, Linda, you as well. Let's see. I hadn't realized the connection to Pollock before, but see it clearly now. Yeah, it's really fun to think about how their process was so similar. Um, it, I guess this isn't really uh, Kelly's cup of tea, but uh, looks like Michelle enjoyed this as well. Thank you. And then Linda also commented that it's interesting that so many of his works seem so asexual. Yeah, they seem really, really benign. So it's interesting to think that he, you know, that the issue of AIDS was as, as so important to him that he was willing to make it something other than that simple benign subject that was appealing to so many people um, that had that really broad appeal in order to, to give it, um, well, the, I mean, sort of the political oomph that it needed to have in order to save lives. Thank you for the kind words as I'm going through this. Um, would you do a child-friendly version? Um, Juliet, why don't you email me? Um, you can find my email at IamCulturallyCurious.com and we can talk about um, whatever aspects of the program that you'd like to share and I could, I'd be happy to share that with you. So, um, so, and, and I, I'll tell you too, I oh, I, oh, a great way to introduce uh, children to Keith Haring is this book. It's fantastic. It's called, it, and it's, it was written by his sis, one of his sisters, and it's called The Boy Who Just Kept Drawing. I shared this with my seven-year-old, and as, as we're reading it, he would get up and he would dance, and he just loved it. And, um, and at the end, it shares with you a lot of the images um, that are featured in the book and gives you like a, good, a great little background for it too. So I highly recommend the book um, as, a, as like a starting, starting a starting place, but feel free to reach out to me too. All right. Thank you so much for the kind words. I think we answered most of the questions. If you'd like to see this again, too, I'm giving this presentation again in two nights for the Amesbury Public Library. So I really appreciate your time tonight and, um, and your attention. Uh, always humbled and honored that you would share your evening with me. So thank you, everybody. Take good care. Have a great night. Oh, somebody said, Linda, you asked uh, where my other presentations are. Just go to my website. I am culturally curious. Thanks.